What's up, everyone? JJ Englert here uh, with Gregory John, uh, the creator of BuildCamp. Today, we're diving into design systems. We're going to be designing a UI in Bubble from a Figma design. And we're going to start with the basics of what is the design system, why we should use it, and then get into actually building in Bubble, going through all those design decisions of what we're making, why we're making those decisions, and how it might affect you and your Bubble app building process. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. I'm going to hand it over to Greg at this time. He's going to go through a couple of slides to go through his design system, and then we're going to start building. Cool? Cool, guys. Yeah, happy, uh, happy and excited to be here. Um, I've been living and breathing design systems now for a few months. I've gone design system crazy down the rabbit hole into the rabbit den and further. So, so uh, thank you for lending me your ear. And I really want to talk to well, you, JJ, and the rest of you about, you know, why I've been deep diving into design systems and why the more, the harder I look, uh, the more I'm just like an absolute believer that all of us should be using design systems or at least understand how they work, right? Let me just share my screen and jump into just a little kind of um, a couple of slides I went to Spain recently for that bubble getaway in Spain, and I did a little masterclass in design systems, and, and now, um, yeah, happy to share what I went through. Awesome. Let's, let's jump in here. All right, guys, all right. yes, so here we go. So first of all, you know, what is a design system? And I think being new to bubble or no code or building, a lot of you guys will be thinking, you know, why do I need a design system? What is it? It sounds difficult. Uh, why do I need to, to use one, basically? And let's just talk about design systems from the very beginning, you know, because they exist everywhere, if you think about it. So who else uses design systems? Now, could you imagine um, if car manufacturers, if Tesla didn't have a design system for the nuts and bolts for the body paneling, for the engine, for the mixture of liquid rubber before it's applied and molded. All right, it would be absolute chaos. No design system causes chaos. Think about the construction in industry. Look at them, they're wireframing their house over here. But everyone is working um, off the same basic set of instructions. So now we could call a design system maybe like a handbook for how things should be built, right? Because these guys, they are building this particular house and will come with its own handbook. And if that didn't exist, this guy at the bottom is going to be using just different size screws or maybe a different size drill bit to this guy up here. We talk about teachers. Teachers have a particular system. Now, we're not, it's not a design system, but it's a system to teach a particular uh, curriculum. That curriculum is created by the government or the state, and then uh, the teacher is the vessel to be able to teach the kids. Think about chefs. I believe Gordon Ramsay still has his one of his very first iterations of a starter on his menu. He's had it on his menu for about 32 years or so in London, in Chelsea. And that recipe would have been passed along to all of the chefs, right, um, over the years. That has to be... That's, it's a, and it's a pretty, pretty tight recipe. It will start from where does the produce come from? It comes from a particular supplier. How is it, uh, how is it stored? What's the temperature of the fridge? When does it come out of the fridge? What, at what boiling point do we need to then drop in those ingredients? And then how is it prepared on the plate? So everyone, as you can see, everyone uses systems, okay? Everyone except, in my experience... <laughs> This guy here, this guy doesn't use a design system. And, you know, he's starting to scale out his app. He wants to hire his first uh, development team. But, you know, all the button sizes are different. All of the colors are slightly different because he forgot the hex code on day three of his build. Then it became day 12 and that hex code started to slip. And now he's got all six or seven different colors and none of them are styles. They're all individually applied to the buttons. The spacing is all wrong. Um, you know, the breakpoints that he's used is wrong. The radius on his cards and pop-ups, you know, they all differ slightly. And I think, I guess what I'm trying to say here is, guys, this is no code, all right? No code is fast um, and hmm. it's cheap, but look, it's not going to be good unless you have discipline. 
And I sent out a tweet earlier today saying, look, I believe the hallmark of a, of a good UI designer is a person that is disciplined in their approach to building, a person that takes time to build out a design system. And that might take, I'm not saying you can't start your build until your design system is in place. It can be developed over time, all right? And I'll talk th you through how I think that can be done. Now, you probably have heard about the four-point system. This is basically a spacing system and a sizing system for pretty much all design systems use this. Um, and the four-point system, it, this is kind of a weird thing to say, but the four-point system is kind of more like the eight-point system, and sometimes we use four. Uh, and I'm going to show you um, examples of as, we, as the numbers increase, we start to jump um, from eight to 16 to 24. But this four-point system allows us to be really granular, granular with our building. Now, all of you... If you have done FlexCamp, one of my courses, you would have seen these numbers, right? 12, 16, 20, 24, 28. What you don't see is 27, 23, 21, 17. You're only going to see in increments of four, but most likely in increments of eight. Okay, so that's how we kind of, this is a sort of the smallest, um, smallest piece of spacing within a design system. And a design system encompasses a lot of things, guys. I apologize for my, my voice cracking a little bit. I'm just recovering from what I think is COVID, but not entirely sure. But it, it, it allowed me to lay on the sofa for a week last week and gather my thoughts. So, hey. <laughs> there we go. There are, there are some benefits. All right. Um, and before we talk about more about, uh, from a granular perspective, how do we make a design system? Let's talk about what it enables, right? Consistency. JJ, I know... Um, JJ, actually, could you sort of talk about your time leading a team of developers? D did you stumble across any sort of problems with maybe some of the more technical people following a design system? Did consistency <laughs> tend to slip at times? Yeah, you know, I feel like you could really feel the quality of bubble developers for how close they can get to that Figma design compared to those that we will get 90% there, right? And for the folks that the team members that get 90% there, it requires a lot of hand holding of, okay, now you submitted this design for QA uh, that you took from Figma from our designer to Bubble, but now we kind of need to hand hold you to get to the next 10%. And that is a bad quality, right? Uh, because that's taking time out of our, you know, more team members. It's delaying mm -hmm. things, right? And so I always look for Bubble developers when I'm hiring if they can really do pixel perfect Figma to bubble. And because it keeps the consistency of our styles and our systems that we established in Figma to bring over to bubble as well. You know, but not only that, if you switch from one page to another and that repeating group is just a little bit down or it's style different or whatever, you create those inconsistencies, then it's a sign of you're not professional. It's unprofessionalism, things like that, right? Yeah. So it stays true all throughout. I find often as well is you would, I ran an agency for a while and, and, and had a really good team. But what I found was that Figma file that we would work from, it would usually encompass, you know, 85% of what we needed to build. But there would be use cases that would arise um, the following Always. week or something we didn't think about. And I often find that if I left it to the technical person to just implement this pop-up or implement this messaging, it wouldn't be part of the design system. And they would kind of need to follow a particular particular design. And, and, and that's okay. I said earlier, the mark of a good UI designer is discipline. It's not creativity. And I actually want to show you what I mean by this uh, in the Figma file soon. Because at the end of the day, a UI designer is about piecing together interfaces that convert. Okay? And it's not about spending time on this illustration. That, that's an illustrator or that's a, just a regular designer. But a, a UI designer is all about discipline. And it's the discipline that creates the sort of this beautiful, coherent interface with us going to have a high conversion rate if people know where to click and get used to. Because bad design uh, creates fatigue or layouts that are inconsistent, they, they create fatigue. Uh, and you want, um, you, know, you want your users to have the best experience possible. I think you right, had and something important there too, just quickly. It's, you said high conversion rate, right? Like we're, we're doing this to sell things, right? We're not doing this just to be pretty. We're doing this to give our business a more successful chance of succeeding, right? Absolutely. So these principles, all these things that we're talking about, it's it's not just being pretty or 
responsive to be responsive. It's, it's to sell things, to help your applications be more successful. And this all contributes towards that. Fantastic. So in terms of design systems, they are all around us, all right? We went through in the medical industry, car manufacturing, and in terms of UI design, which is what we're focusing on, probably the most famous design system is Bootstrap, all right? Um, Bootstrap has been around for a long, long time. Many of you who are coders would have probably used Bootstrap in the past. Um, Tailwind is a very popular one. Tailwind are the guys, they created the hero icon set that I use as well. Love Tailwind. Um, and then, you know, Material UI by Google. Um, Adobe have one. Figma have their own one. Everyone has one. So, the, and if you look at those numbers, so I've adopted Bootstrap. And what's the, why did I adopt Bootstrap? What's the important thing here? I adopted Bootstrap because Bubble has sort of an inkling of adopting Bootstrap themselves within the responsive editor. We can see uh, these breakpoints of 768, 992, 1200. That's a Bootstrap standard. Um, and then, but you know, you might come across Figma um, UI kits that they use Material UI. So they might, their mobile breakpoint might be 600 and not 576. But guys, it doesn't matter as long as you use one. That's, that's key. Make your own. Start with Bootstrap um, and then venture out and make your own. Maybe, but, 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 but what I will say is when it does come to sizing and breakpoints, I would definitely just use one of these, okay, Material, Tailwind, and Bootstrap. Learn it, and then you know it. That's it. No need to sit on a blank canvas or wonder, how do I build this pop-up? Well, you build the pop-up because you always build a pop-up the same way. You're always going to have 32 pixels, left, right, top, bottom padding. When it gets mm -hmm. down to mobile, it's going to convert to 16. You're always going to have a H3 title, and you're going to have a subtitle that is 16 pixels. The gap in between the, the title and the subtitle is always going to be 12. And then the gap on the actual, um, actual pop-up itself is probably going to be 24 pixels. You just learn the system and employ the system. That's what I love about it, because earlier on I said that you know, the benefits are consistency, precision, adaptability, adaptability, and predictability. It's also time-saving. It is really so fast once you use a design system because you're giving your brain a break instead of thinking cognitively, what spacing should I employ here? Or instead of not thinking and going, oh, I'm 16 pixels for this pop-up, 24 pixels for that pop-up. What do I feel like now? I'll yeah. just do 15 here, 14 here, get on with it. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. So guys, I would, if you don't have a system, I would suggest start with Bootstrap, okay? Get bootstrap.com uh, is something that you can have a read, but it's, it's, it's there, there's a lot there. And there's a lot there to do with like button sizes and how the radius would increase when the button goes from 40 pixels to 48 pixels or when the button's at, at 40 pixels and we use 14 pixels text instead of 16. So there's a lot there. I love geeking out on this stuff, but I'd say start small. Um, and let me actually jump into Bubble. And I just wanted to show you on a Bubble app I'm working on at the moment, a design system I'm building where I can, I'm going to build it once. Every time I need to build a Bubble app, I'm just going to clone that app and my design system is integrated, right? Because it does take a bit of time to um, get up and running. All right, let's stop sharing this and let's just share the next one. And then after this, we're 15 minutes in, JJ, we can jump in and start building. Get right to it. All right, so let's go to, um, I'm going to go here, this beginner's camp. So within Bubble itself, within Bubble itself, um, this is basically a design system I'm building at the moment, okay? So we got our H1 text uh, down to body extra small. This would be 12 points. This would probably be either 72 or, or 60. doesn't matter. It's a system, and that system is going to work for me. Now, when we talk about design systems, what we need to do is build out what I like to call um, primitives first. Now, primitives make up components. So if we think of about a button element, a button element has color and a button element has text. So you could probably now call this, um, so we'll go from a primitive to something like, uh, actually, I actually don't know, what, what is the name? Because after this would get a component, but it's the combination of color and text 
that we can start applying our primitives to create things to you know style our, our visual elements i guess it's just that it's just a visual elements once we have our primitives which involves text and color and even things like radius and spacing once we have those things in place um, we can then style our elements and create our components so we go from the primitives to the elements to the components and this is basically a component all right let me actually yeah that's fine you can see that so a component is made up of these various visual elements. And if we go one back, the visual elements are made up of the primitives. So those are the kind of, when I think about a design system, those are the three levels I like to think about. Okay. Now, when it comes to building just, for instance, this login box, this box actually encompasses everything or pretty much everything in my design system. Let's just have a quick look to see what's in here. So we can see that we have um, 48 pixels of padding all the way around, all right? 32 pixels would be fine as well. Just depends, it's the design choice. Um, up here in this header area, we have 24 pixels of row gap. We have an icon here. Um, and then we have your title and supporting text. All right? Well, you and see how here, everything is 8, 24, 12, 36, yeah. within that four. Yeah, exactly. So I have some gap here of 24, and then when I jump into text, now we need to talk about proximity because proximity matters. Here are two like items. If we are reading a title, we don't want this subtitle to be like all the way down here because now they're not related. So we need to relate things with proximity. So this is where the spacing becomes uber, uber important. So I've got 24 here, but now like items or um, items that that these items need proximity. So we've got eight between them. If we come down here, we've got another group. These inputs are closer together. This login button is further away from this group. It needs to stand on its own two feet here. And then obviously down here as well. But all of the spacing is thought through and consistent across my entire app. If I have two inputs in a column anywhere in my app, I'm always going to use 20 pixels of row gap between my inputs, always. Wherever I have um, a pop-up or a login or something with a H3, I'm always going to have eight pixels of row gap between them. All right. So, and again, if we could just jump back, we've got a component. That co component is made up of elements. Those elements were styled according to the primitives that I created. All right, and give you to give you a quick look in my style variables. Here I have my system colors uh, that obviously they're hard coded, so we need to put something in there. But here I have some variables in here as well. And I, like I use you have your background borders. You kind of say what it's about. What about yes. maybe adding like the hex color in that title too? You think that's advantageous? It could be. It depends if you see. I I would rather. So these are actually called. In Figma, we call these tokens. Um, so it's easier to, if I just said neutral 100, well, then yeah. a developer has to learn that that's for a background. Yeah. But because yeah. I've written background here, now it's more of like a token. Um, I don't think a developer, they obviously will get this. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah. But it's more important that we know what is applied to, is applied sure. to backgrounds. It's applied to text. It is a hover effect on my primary button. This is the hover color, all right? And usually I'd have a press color as well. Yeah. But this is just a very, very simple color representation. I did a YouTube video recently on building a color system, and that actually used all 32 uh, variables available. Um, and that is more to do with, like, uh, surface color on the primary. So, like, a 10% blue here, right? Um, it would be mm -hmm. to do with hover color, a pressed color, that kind of thing. Yeah. I think the only time where I find it beneficial to use hex color is when you're in the styles drop down and you're trying to find that match in Figma to where that hex might be. That's right, when yeah. I might like using, you know, your hex color in that drop down there. But I like how exactly. you're saying, hey, these are my backgrounds. These are my borders, placeholder, et cetera. That's it. That's it. All right. One last thing. Um, and then actually, no, it's 20 past. I think we should jump in. Let's um, do it. JJ, and I'm going to hand it over to you. But let's let's continue with this conversation. Always. 
So the goal is here that we're going to try and work through today is building this UI together. Okay. And Gregory, John, and I, we're going to go through and just discuss how we're going to structure each of these. Okay. So I, I have the Figma link. I'm going to share it one more time here. You guys can all join and follow along. Also, feel free to open up your own bubble app and create this with us. We're not going to get through the entire thing, but we want to get through a good amount to the point of you're seeing us make real-time decisions of how we're structuring these um, and kind of using our systems in this way to create you know, responsive design from desktop to mobile. And if you're doing this the right way, you don't even really need to get into your responsive tab because you're already structuring this with the know-how of, hey, this is going to break down at a good point because of such, right? So here we are in Figma. And the first thing that we have that we're looking at here is our header. And so the first thing that I look at here is, okay, well, I have a header and this is going to be a main container, right? And I'm going to need another container within here because this container doesn't have a max width, but this container has a max width. So that's the immediate thing that I'm thinking of. How about you, Greg? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I drop into the canvas is always going to be a section. Section spans edge to edge, and a section takes up basically it's the vertical layout. So multiple sections make up your page. Uh, but obviously, as JJ said, that we need a max width because we don't want someone to have to push their mouse on a big screen or chime on now. I don't have to take my mouse all the way to the top right hand corner, like using my mouse pad and scrubbing so I can get there. I always want a centered design. A centered design is fast uh, and it's, it's basically easier to look at. If you think of Twitter, I think the Twitter max width is like 840 or something. It's very, very narrow. Uh, and it's designed that way on purpose. It centers the content. You're always looking down the center of the screen. You can navigate around very, very quickly. So when it comes to nav bars, or basically this entire design we're doing today has a max width of 1200. 1200, copy that. Now, before we even get there, our pages. When we set off our pages, obviously we don't want a fixed page. I'll normally go with a column. And then my width, I'll normally go 1440 or 1280. Where are you at? Mm. So I use Bootstrap, basically. Um, and that's the cool thing, JJ, about today is that we actually have, it sounds like we have a different system, but it's important that we have a system. So yeah. I want to learn about yours. You tell me about mine. So 1440, yeah. 1440 is the accepted approach by most designers because, yep. and there's one reason for it. Because when you start a new document in Figma, you pick the desktop document and that's 1440. And I can't see any other kind of reason why people use 1440 aside from that. Uh, I that. use 1400 because it's a bootstrap standard, 1400. So yeah, ah. that's up to you. Use 1440, I'd say. Cool. No, that, uh, we'll keep it with 1400. That's good. All right, let's go 1400. Yeah. I'm, not a, I'm not a 1400 guy, but now I am. Look at that. <laughs> so we have a column 1400 width for our builder and we have our first group here. And so I'm just going to take this group, I'm going to make it a column, and I'm going to remove the fixed width on it, right? And it's because I know that I have this main outer group, and I'm just going to rename this group to, you know, header, um, something like that, right? So I have this header, and I also styled it with a bit of a background color just for demonstration purposes, so you can see this color, what it might be. But I have this header here, and I have no max width or min width set on it yet, right? And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to need to grab another group here, and I'm going to drag, drag it within here. So when you go to format this group, Greg, what are we looking at here? I mean, we, we know that we need to get in here to have an inner group here. And this inner group is most likely going to be a row, right? Because we have, you know, a container here. We have a container here. And then we're going to need some inner containers. But mm. looking at a row with a max width on this. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, correct. It looks like we have 32 pixels of padding within that container as well. Okay, so I'm going to bring this in. I'm going to center this, but I'm just going to go here. I'm going to center this. I'm going to max width. It's 1,200. And I'm going to bring in my vertical alignment here. Get that container alignment right there. And it's going to be inner nav, G inner nav. Um, and then we have, well, we have a padding on this. What was the padding again? 24? Uh, 32. 32. So in this around. particular design, we're using 32 padding for desktop sizes and 16 for mobile sizes. Okay. And then what would be, and now if we're just going to go back to this tab, I'm going to pull up this height here, uh, properties height 44. Yeah. So um, the nav bar is 80 tall um, and it, it doesn't actually matter, I'd say the height of this particular inner uh, element, because if the nav bar is fixed, 
at 80 was fixed at 80. So I wouldn't bother too much with the height of that. I would just make it 80 as well. Okay. Copy that. All right. So now what we have here is we have this inner container. We have our outer container. Um, and then we have our padding around here with our 32s going across. Uh, we have a min height on the header. And then we have this inner container. So now what we need to do is we need to go in and start building this inner container here. So now this is going to be another, actually just like it is in Figma, we're going to have one group here that's a row. And then this is going to be another row group. And then this is going to be an, another group with what an mm. image and uh, text is it or yep. the logo. And I think also in the nav bar, should we just remove top and bottom padding? Just keep left, right padding. Um, we, we basically, we, we don't need it because it's not going to grow. So I like to keep... Um, so if you jump back into bubble, let, let's just have another quick look. So what I would do here is if you go to the nav, the actual nav bar container, the main parent, yep. I would actually, rem, re, I, if I was you, well, the way I would do it, excuse sure. me, is I would actually remove all padding from that container. It, when it okay. comes to my sections, I don't put sections on my, um, I would do it on the inner container up right here. to 32 pixels left right there. Okay. Yeah, well, and no bottom as well. I think you've got bottom and top. So I'll do just just left and right. And okay. the reason why we don't need top and bottom is because it's a fixed height nav bar. So this is just the one exception uh, where I wouldn't put top bottom right because it's always going to be centered. Yeah, perfect. Okay. All right. So from there, what we have is now I just brought this in to make this go a little bit faster. But now we have this container. And this container is a layout of row with a left alignment. And then within that, let me just get in a little bit closer for everyone. Within that, we have another row container. Here we're mm. using an image, all right? And this image is utilizing, it's just a one-to-one -one aspect ratio. That's fine. And then we have our text, uh, our text, what is it, visual element over here. And then for this container here, it's a row. I think the most important thing here is the gap spacing, right? It's 40. So... You could make a case because there's only one gap spacing to get lazy and just do like a, a right margin or a left margin on this, right? <laughs> but I'm still team column gap, row gap, whenever possible. It just yeah. makes things so much easier in the long run. I think if you also have a system and you work within a team, just use one particular spacing um, attribute. So margin, I use margin 1% of my build. It's kind of yeah. a redundant thing for me now. Yeah. Agreed. Um, all right. So over here, we have another navigation. So it's our G nav, and it's going to be a row. And it's still left container alignment. And we're just using a 32 column gap, gap on this. All right. And so each of these text elements, you can see they have a no min width on it, right? It's all fit and width the content, which keeps everything nice, snappy, uh, coming together and, and as tight as can be. And so it's really nice responsive there. Now, if you wanted to get really fancy with this, which I think this would be overkill, but you could turn this into a repeating group and use option sets for this. And that way it would keep your menu dynamic, but you don't need to do that because your menu shouldn't be changing that much where you need to have a dynamic changing. And so I think this is perfectly fine to do something like this. Um, but so yeah. I, yes, occasionally on a footer element, <clears throat> I sometimes yeah. use uh, repeating groups, nested repeating groups, uh, just for design purposes. You know, it just means it's one element and designing in one cell as opposed to designing in like four different columns and all the way through. So that's the one occasion where I would, for UI design, I actually would use a repeating, a repeating group. Um, and yeah. obviously, if it's an option set, then it's, it's pretty fast, preloaded. Um, it tends to work quite well. Yeah, here's a question from Reginald. Uh, he uses, uses aligned apparent to for his pages so mm. why might this be why not use this i guess is my question to you um because i think it would be an unusual use case for a line to parent um websites are built left to top to bottom left to right uh in rows and columns uh, i think an align to parent is more of an edge case use case again if reginald if you had to go and work in a team you start using a line to parent it would be it's just an unusual approach I think um, Align to Parent works well in certain instances. Uh, I use it like centering icons. Very in groups. specific. You know, yeah. Left or right or whatever, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Let's, uh, let's, if we stick to like professional standards of web developments, this is exactly how it's done. Cool. Cool. 
cool. If anyone else has questions, feel free to bring it up and we'll, we'll answer as we can. Um, so we're getting back here to our Figma design. So now we got to hit up our right side uh, container over here. And so that is going to be another container that is a row container. And we within that row container, we have a button and a text element. All right. And so now I'm going to come back over here. And I've quickly created that stuff, but it's all hanging over here to the left-hand side. So what is something really quick and easy that we can do, Greg, to bring this container to the right-hand side? Yeah, if we have a look at the distribution options or the alignment options beneath the row, we've, we've got a whole lot of options there for the positioning of what we need. And we need that left group, uh, which are similar items, your nav, your logo, everything on the left. We need that on the left. We need the buttons on the right-hand side. So we'll push them apart. So if you hover over the last option, we've got something called space between. Uh, and that's a great use case, uh, flex use case. One of my favorite, I guess, alignment options is space between because uh, it, it, it yeah. achieves exactly what we want to do here. So just pushing things to the left and right side of the page. Yeah, I, I normally always use space between, and I don't use space around that often. If I need space around, I'll have some kind of padding or some of my own control. I think Never space used around, it. Yeah, <laughs> it, it just doesn't give me what I Never It doesn't give it. me the control that I need. So it's always yeah. space between for me, and then I, I, I go from there. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. So here we have our header here. Um, and we can get into our next component there. Um, but before that, I just want to show you quickly, you know, so we have this little line break here, right? So I'm just going to quickly show you how to do that line break. Um, and then we'll get into our hero component here. So I'm going to go back into my bubble tab and I'm going to go to this main container, right? It's another reason why we need this main container that doesn't have a max width to, to bring us that full width, right? And so what we could do is we can go into our appearance. We could define each border independently, and then we can use our bottom and do a solid on that. Now, I'm just going to go into Figma real quick and just grab whatever hex color that is. I actually, I think the color is in there, JJ. I, I think I copied it in. Wow, look at that. So what we might be doing here. So neutral. It, it, Probably right neutral, two, neutral 200 yeah. or so. Neutral 200, it, that's hmm. should be it. Uh, like, do you want to change the screen? You're still in the Figma. Oh, my fault. Oh, there it is. I used the wrong one. So neutral 200 right here. Yeah, that's it. Is that hex color we're getting? And now, now I'm just going to pull off this background color here. And now here we go. We have this beautiful, beautiful. header that we just created. Um, <laughs> let me let me switch off here. Let me add this real quick. Um, it's a very secure. <laughs> very secure username and password there but the fact that you have it is always good greg <laughs> <laughs> all right here we go coming back to this so now here we are this beautiful header for our you uh, for our design now quickly let's just maybe talk a little bit about mobile and bringing this down to mobile before we get into our hero greg mm. so we have um you know this section here at what point do you start to break this down and hide it conditionally yeah, so um, according to Bootstrap, that should happen at 992. Okay. Um, and in this particular app, I actually created an option set of breakpoints. If, if you just share your editor again, um, let's just have a look at that option set. And this is a neat little trick I use here. So if we talk about um, s semantically uh, laying out your spacing system, into something I like to call tokens. Um, so instead of having to remember 576, 768, 992, 1200, and those numbers you will remember when you start to use them. But instead of having to remember that, you could always just say, let's, let's break it down at large. Breakpoint is large, let's break it down there. So what I did was I created a, a breakpoint option set, a set in those options, and then I created a number field called width, and then I applied those various breakpoints. So if you just open up the large, please, JJ, modify yep. attributes on the large. So the large breakpoint, oh, change it to two, <laughs> please. <laughs> nine, nine, two. All right. Yeah. And again, guys, this is just what Bootstrap says. So I'm following a system and that, that works really well. So we save that. Yep. All right. So then back in our design, um, what we need to do is we need a conditional on the button group that says, and you can see it there. Can we zoom into that a little bit? If you don't mind. Yeah. And these, this, this one expression I use 
on all the elements, all right? They use it on all, it's the breakpoints, but it's also a conditional change for text size. It's a conditional change for gap, spa gap spacing reduction. It's a conditional change because when you get down to mobile, we don't want the text to be as big. We don't want the buttons to be as short. We want edge to edge buttons, but, but we'll get there. So if you actually just delete that, and let's, let's just uh, create that again. Yeah, if you just delete that yeah. guy. Yeah. So when it comes to responsive design, um, you know, we design responsively. We don't make things responsive, but we do need to set the breakpoints. And what I'm about to, what we're about to go through now, guys, is something that Bubble is building and um, they're building this into the actual editor, the ability to just select or, or set your breakpoints and then just select them from the conditional tab. Beautiful. So, but I've built this manually. So we say current page width. Oh, okay. Smaller than sign. Yeah, this the zoom's not going. Ah, work. I see. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. And then, then let's just go find. We go still get an option. Uh, let's get the large option. There you go. Um, and then, sorry, the width. Yeah. Yep. So what that says is, when the current page width is smaller than nine nine two, hide that button group and make sure the button group collapses that horizontal space as well. So let's bring that down. There it goes, uh, and she's gone. But obviously, JJ, we need to replace, um, you know, we, we, we need a, a bars icon for mobile there. Yep. Yeah. And I guess I don't want to go on too much of a tangent here, but mobile menus, I feel like, can be hard sometimes. You know, so like we could bring in a material icon here and that'll be conditionally mm -hmm. shown. And then from there, are you doing like a floating group that is popping out with your menu item there? Is it some kind of full screen thing? What is your normal mm -hmm. approach to building that that menu for mobile? Yeah, for mobile, I've um, just decided to use <laughs> pop-ups that uh -huh. are all just solid color. Okay. So it almost looks like another page. Uh, and I've noticed that Webflow do the same. Um, and a lot of sort of design people are starting to do the same. Just make it big, make it bold, so you can you know press it with your thumb. Um, I'm, not, I'm moving away from kind of slide out bars where you can see some of the canvas. Yeah. It's no need. It's no need. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a nice look, but it's not as functional. Just make it functional, click the button, do what yeah. they need to do with that. Yeah. Cool. All right, so here we are. We have our header. So now let's move into our design for our hero. And so we're seeing that we have our main container here. And this can, well, I guess the main container is here. And then within that, we have an inner container. So with and this then, container- And then two others within there as well. So and we now have two four others. in total, yeah. There's a lot of containers. You, you go pretty pretty deep in your containers, but um, I think this container again, no max width. It is you know your container for your your hero container, and then within here, this is the whole vertically aligned <clears throat> center by center, horizontally aligned by center, and you have a max width. This has a max width seemingly of 1280 on it. Um, you mm. know, and then from there we get into this is a row container, and then within this row container we have this side. This is column, right? So we have, yeah. uh, well, that's a row in itself, but we have a column one, two, three, and then four. And then over here, we have our image. And so we're really breaking this down into smaller containers here as we go. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's build a little bit of this. We don't need to build all this in real time. Uh, I want to make sure that this session is more about us talking through how we're building this than um, spending too much time building it. What would be nice is we can pretty much learn all of the lessons for design just in this hero section now. So I think let's build out the hero section, but then let's conditionally start applying that 992 breakpoint and change. Okay. Um, because we need to apply it to the text, subtitle, buttons, uh, the image needs to switch out, um, all of that good stuff. Okay. So here we are, we have our main hero container that we just talked through, right? Yeah. And you can see that we have a conditional on this for your bottom padding. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually it would be good, JJ, if let's, let's just, because we're gonna build this in tandem with the design, let's just go back to Figma. And I wanted to point out how the mobile spacing system is different or is adapted. Okay, when it comes to desktop, we would usually use 96 pixels. Now this is the 
untitled UI system we, we're working with now, okay? Obviously, Figma doesn't have, they do now, but during the creation of untitled UI, there's no, there's no breakpoint system, but you can now do it. Um, so we don't have instructions for breakpoints, which is why we've been using Bootstrap for breakpoints. But in terms of the actual padding, what untitled UI does is a section, edge to edge. Within the section, uh, that section divides the page up vertically. On mm -hmm. desktop, that section will have 96 pixels of bottom padding. But on mobile, that's too much. So on mobile, this 96 will conditionally change to 64. That's it. That is consistent across all of their designs. And the same goes for when they use gap spacing in the hero section, there's some gap spacing of, I think it's uh, 48 pixels of gap spacing in their, in their content container that changes to 24 uh, on, on mobile. And the text sizes as well. Text sizes will change from a H2 to H3 in terms of sizing, not in terms of H tags. Um, and then the buttons are edge to edge. So the buttons are the big change here. Okay, let's have a look at the buttons on the hero on the desktop. Yep. See those buttons? They're Obviously, small. we've got, yeah, they're small, fit width to content, fantastic. Yep. When you get to mobile, we've got edge to edge. That, so that is a second condition we'll be using on the buttons, and it's called a min width condition. We set min width to 100% for buttons, and uh, that happens also. You know, I just tend to use 992JJ. Like what I've discovered, actually, this is a good, good point to quickly talk about um, screen sizes because yeah. something I talk about uh, at FlexCamp, uh, my responsive design course at BuildCamp, is we should be talking about screen sizes, not really device sizes. So we say mobile, which is great. We say desktop. Uh, yeah. And then in between, we usually refer to tablet. Um, and, 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 and that's fine. And, and what I've realized is tablets are getting larger and phones are getting larger. And mm -hmm. this is kind of like um, between 4 to 5 and up to like 992 or 1000 or 1024, it's kind of like this dead space that not many devices use that. Most tablets now are like 1024 or above, uh, but we still refer to a tablet as 768, w which is fine. Um, uh, but, but as such, I just tend to say at 992, all of the big changes are happening and now we're at mobile sizes. That's just what I do. Because 768 is too narrow for a, a two-column yep. hero section yep. to collapse. It's too narrow. So that usually dictates. The same with the nav bar. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I'm pointing, but uh, I'm yeah. not sure why. But the <laughs> nav bar, the nav bar cannot... The navbar breakpoint needs to be more than 768. So if we jump up another increment according to bootstrap sizes, it's 992. So at 992, all the big changes happen for me. I don't start screwing around. I don't say 992 for nav, 992 for hero. And now down here, this piece, 768 or 576. I don't do that. I'm just like, I care less about anything That's below good. 992 or like larger than 425. I'm going to inherit that one because I always do seven, six, eight. That's like my break point to go down. But then you're right. My hero gets screwed up. And so I have to have specific condition for that hero to get from 992 to seven, six, eight, which is then additional work. So yeah. breaking it down to a tablet and starting at 992 sounds like a good idea to me. Yeah. Yeah. Easy. Done. Uh, yeah. Most use cases. And, and it will be functional. It might look a little bit stretched out at like 991. Yeah. But we're talking about a, a tiny percentage of users. I think when I look at my analytics at, at uh, BuildCamp, um, you know, it's all desktop and phone. There's like no tablet in there. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And, and it's hard to your point. It's hard because not, you know, devices are all different sizes, right? So it's like, well, you're designing for 300, 400, 700, 768, 992, right? Like you want to mm. be nice on all, you know, screens. Um, but you don't want to have to obviously design for every screen. So if you have a system that breaks down adequately, that should get you still for all screens. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Vinay has a question about this hero section. So should we jump in and look at this um, this 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 breakpoint? How do we make the column stack basically? Because we have a row that we need to turn into a column. <clears throat> uh, right here, this one. Um, yeah, or, that parent there. Yeah, that parent. Yeah. So, so if we just look at this hero section, so we have our we have our section edge to edge. 
we always just drop in a section. This is our new workspace according to our Y axis. Um, yeah. And then we have another group and that other group is centered 1200 max width or 1280 doesn't matter as long as it's the same system within your app. We have a max width that keeps these two groups contained down the center, nice and aligned with the nav bar. And then within that, um, we have our row. We have two columns side by side. Now, as we start to squeeze down, JJ, if you go to, say, 992, actually, if you go to 992, yeah, exactly, and then just one pixel down from there, mm. there's the break. So there's a 991 is where we break, right? Yeah, right there. Yeah, over there, over there. So let's look at how to achieve this because this is how you do it. This is how you do a row hero, a two-column hero section. Um, and it's on the conditional of the group, basically, the, the those two groups. Yeah. So on the right-hand side, I can see that, again, I'm using my standard breakpoint. Current page width is smaller than 992. Yeah. If, if you go back to the UI builder, it might be easier to see and then Spectre. Yeah, that group there. So what I'm doing, I'm instructing that group content to span... 100% edge to edge of its parent container, of its parent container, okay? So that what, that's what forces that to go edge to edge and for the image to drop beneath. Now the image needs the same thing. You can't just have the text or that image was gonna like be pushed out uh, into infinity. So the image has basically the same thing. Um, uh, sorry, not the image, the container, the parent container to the image. There it is. Yep, group content, there it is there. Yep. So, so both are instructed at 992 to take up 100% of its parent container. The parent container is the 1200 container, one above. Uh, and that's basically the, not the secret, but that's the technique I use for all of my apps. Don't need to change. That's what works. Awesome. So we have this main container here. And then within that container, we have another container, which is our inner container. And we have this is set up as a row. And we're using a row gap for forty eight. Now, row, you don't you don't need a row gap here, but when don't you need do row gap, no, that was uh, sorry, we do need row row gap. Yeah. We don't need column gap. That that was what I was getting to is you don't need a row gap here, but as soon as you get into your mobile, that row gap comes into play, right? Um, and so we have our row gap, and then we have our left side container here. It's just uh, G left content, and then within that, it's a column. And we have a row gap of 48. And then we get into these smaller containers here. Um, and you can see that we've divided it by a top and a bottom here. So that allows us to take this, um, this container, apply a vertical alignment with a row gap, and we'll be able to get some spacing between this one and this one nicely. All right. Perfect. And then within that, we get into deeper containers, which are, let's just go down this rabbit hole in the element tree quickly. Now we're in the row container for this top one then within that we get into our text within that another text all this is using our column spacing now i had a uh, row spacing sorry i had a friend recently suggested was like hey is row and column gap spacing uh applicable for all browsers and to my knowledge i haven't seen it not work on any browsers to you what about you no it should it, it should work yeah no that's uh it's definitely applicable across the board yeah. Um, something else I wanted to get into as well is, um, if you don't mind, just break it down at, yeah, no, go to like 375. Now, guys, be, before you do that, JJ, guys, have a look at the size of the text. Smart business credit cards. Beneath that, we've got a, a, the subtitle text or the H2. Have a look at that. Okay. Now, drop down to, yeah, 320, but pull it up to about 375. Um, can you see the size of the text has changed? A lot has changed here. All of the text has gone one size down, and all of the spacing has changed. Yeah, and this is something I do not glaze over because mobile is important, especially for your yeah. marketing your marketing pages. Yeah. So again, as part of the system that I've created for myself, it's just I don't need to think. All right, my H one is in there. That's going to turn into like a H three in terms of size. My text XL is going to turn into text LG from extra large to large. My spacing will go from will go from thirty two to twenty four. Buttons will go edge to edge, and look at the left right padding. Have you noticed we've gone from thirty two pixels left right padding on the parent container down to sixteen on the hero? Uh, 
container. Uh, one up. There we go. Yeah, that hero container yep. that has a conditional. That conditional is the same breakpoint at 992. Please change the left right pad into 16 pixels. Same technique across the ball. Works for everything. There we go. Fantastic. So we have our hero. Uh, we have our header here. Let's preview it. Let's see what we're looking like. So that's looking really nice. You can pull up your Chrome tools to get down into your different breakpoints as well. Um, don't know why we're getting that. But there we go. Different breakpoints. I like how this image kind of comes out like that. You have no max width set on these buttons. So you're forcing your min width to 100% on these buttons once that breakpoint hits. You're adjusting your text to be smaller for different breakpoints as well. Uh, we don't JJ, have are we looking at the same thing? We're in the editor on the responsive tab. Oh, sorry about yep. that. My yep, fault. Right. Cool. Uh, so I'm going to bring that back up, and I'll just show you. You know, we can get into our Chrome tools there, and then play around with this. We have the full width here that we're stretching um, on that uh, at that min width there. Sorry. All right, scroll there. There we go. Um, and then you know we can adjust our sizes from there. Um, so our preview is looking nice. We have that full width there. We have our buttons, um, demo, all that stuff is looking really nice so far. Let's get Fantastic. back to our Figma design here. And now we're looking over at this group. And so, um, we, you know, we have 10 minutes last, left here. <laughs> and I want to see how, maybe if we get down to this one right here, how we might structure this um, or any other questions that we might have to, to finish up with this last 10 minutes as we've gone through general layouts now, how we're thinking about these, how we're structuring these. Now it kind of gets a little repetitive of we've already made these just decisions, these choices. And now it's just laborious of making all these containers, rows, gaps, et cetera. You see that we're really not using aligned apparent um, at all. You know, like uh, like Gregory was saying earlier, I only really use aligned apparent when I have uh, in it, uh, a group that needs like one thing hung over here, one thing hung in the middle, and it gets really weird and you just need maximum placement. Otherwise, I'm staying away from aligned apparent. I'm just using my row, my my columns. Um, I got my column spacing, my row spacing at all times, always padding, very little margin. Um, and yeah, that does the trick. Absolutely. And guys, um, do yourself a favor and get to know Figma a little bit. It's such an education. When I started to get to know Figma, Figma uses Flex as well. I use space between. They're now, they've now got variables, breakpoints. It's pretty incredible. But moreover to the point, download some UI kits. And you will see yep. systems because that's what a UI kit is. It's a handbook. It's a system. So with Untitled UI, I've adopted their approach to particularly like their spacing system more than anything. I use a slightly different sort of button styling to them. But it's just an education. It is right there. It's, if you want to learn to be a good UI designer, look at what he's done. You, Untitled UI, what I'd say, it's a huge kit, but it starts at the primitives and then the visual elements, which are created as components. And then we've got variations of components. What I'm trying to say is that Untitled UI has like 50 landing pages, but those landing pages boil right back to an initial component to initial button that they're made. And it's just these little variations that he's making. Um, but it's, it's just an absolute education to see how he's scaled out the system that he's used to then create hundreds of different types of design iterations. And as long as you're using the system, you can just keep going and going and going. You don't need to think. It's just there for you. Agreed. Let's talk through how we might build something like this because I think there's a little bit more challenging mm -hmm. to build in Bubble, right? So we have our container here and you know we have this stuff up here. That's fine. But how are we getting this repeating group here? And then it expands all the way over there, right? So obviously we don't need any kind of right margin or right padding or anything like that because we want this to expand all the way through. Um, let, Greg, what do you think? Yeah, so definitely um, a horizontal scroll repeating group is what we yep. have. As you said, no right hand padding, so it bleeds all the way through. That bleed will be created organically depending on the size of your cell, but also depending on the size of the width of your page. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I really love the actual cells themselves. So it looks like we have probably have a group with a background image, and then there's little frosted, uh, little frosted cards on top. Um, that that's actually achievable. 
uh, using some blur. Uh, you can use CSS to do that, but but I think Bubble does have a blur option. I don't think I've ever used it, but I think huh. it does have it. I mean, alternatively, you can just export that. No, that wouldn't work. I was thinking of exporting that, using that as a background. Yeah, it needs on to be group. dynamic. No, yeah. it needs to be dynamic, doesn't it? Um, yeah, I so think it you might. No, the content needs to be dynamic, but I think the background, you can possibly upload that as a PNG because it's a transparent image. So that yeah, might actually work. Yeah, but look how the height but... differs between the two. But if it's a group, that's fine. So the group is just going to be set to column. So that can grow. Um, yeah, but it, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. Yeah. Yeah, but this would be a horizontal repeating group. And now at, at some point, even though we don't see it here, at some point, this repeating group would still want to have a max width on it, right? So, like, maybe the max width is, like, 1,400, so it stops doing that effect at that way on, like, really wide screens, would you say? Yeah, uh, yeah, always 1,200 for me, max width, unless I decide to build an app and it's at 1,400. Uh, I just, you yeah. know, if it's uh, anything related to, like, um, if it's not a design-based app, like I always, I always look at, I love the Webflow site. I love their Academy page and it's dark, but they flexing design first and foremost. So they're trying to get as like crazy as possible. Most of the time when we're building apps these days, the apps we use on our phones or the apps we interface with every day, social media sites, it's actually quite a basic design, right? And it's, yeah. I don't think we always need to think too much about what should the max width be. Just, hey, choose something. <laughs> That's yeah. it. 1200 yeah. 1400 who cares as long as it's consistent between your pages yeah so we have a question here from greg how do you have an advice for images maintaining the original format and keeping them sharp so the first thing is i always use the aspect ratio here if you use the aspect ratio of the actual image this will keep it sharp and bubble's gotten pretty good lately because they were able to automatically detect this ratio and that works really well but one thing i really want to ask you greg and this is something i learned from you really early on is your uh, Imix, you know, process with Imix. Are you yeah. still using that in your builds? No. So, I th yeah, I think it's pronounced Image IX. Um, so, I, I, yeah. I find that Image IX is buggy. Um, okay. I'm always getting emails saying Image IX is down. Do you get those emails? No, I don't. <laughs> you don't. I always get them. Uh, I don't know why I subscribe to these boring things, but I, <laughs> I think um, Bubble released a new feature called Zoom okay. for processing images. I used to use Image IX. Or to cut like a circle but now you don't need to now you can just zoom into an image and I, I that might even be bubble using image ix in the background i don't know yeah but um i don't really use image ix to be honest um you know okay. uh yeah i just if it's a round image then i just zoom into it and i make sure it's a circle okay yeah and then from there we'll just you know if it's a circle we'll just get to what is it something like that and that will come out to be your circle for you with that yeah. zoom and you're using yeah. that aspect ratio. Well, in this case, it doesn't apply, but yeah. And that zoom will just make it so they'll, it'll take the entire thing. It's kind of what Im uh, image IX or whatever, how you pronounce it used to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Image IX had other features, but most of them were like silly features like apply, apply a uh, sepia effect or it's just all of that stuff was redundant. Um, but I've been trying to use image IX trying to not use it where possible just because it's another service that can go down and then your images aren't yeah. rendering correctly. So I think, I think in the background... All, I think it's also rendering on the client side, which just takes a bit more on your client to render that as well. Yeah. yeah. Which is just extra processing. Absolutely. Um, quick question from Matt. Is it necessary to name every group? I name every group and with the intention of, I want to see as much as possible in the elements tree without having to get into like, what is this kind of thing, Right. And so mm -hmm. that's why I always will take my groups and I'll just get group out of there and I'll bring it down to G and then I'll bring it there. And so this will kind of allow me to see a little bit more here now, but it's still, this is a little bit long. And so something like this would be, you know, I don't even know what it'd be. It, it's whatever naming structure is good for you. But for my quick naming conventions, group is G, floating group is FG, pop up is PU, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. image is I, um, what else do we got here? Our, our repeating group is RG. Uh, group focus is GF. And that just allows me to keep all my elements names still within the element tree so I can see what kind of element it is, but to have, be as short as possible so I can have as much context in the actual text so I can quickly navigate to what I need to in the elements tree. 
um, you know, and kind of see everything from there. So I try to, it's also really helpful when working with teams, you know, we always got to think about like, how are we building that allows other people to join what we're building and continue. Right. And so by naming those groups, it, it helps with that. I know we get into like, there's a lot of groups and so maybe not everyone, but the best you can with that, I think is, is what I would recommend. Cool. Um, what else do we got? Anything else before we head out of here, guys? I appreciate all of you for joining us today. Um, you have access to the Figma. If you guys want to go off and design that and shoot it over to us, we'll give you your th our thoughts on you know how you did. Uh, otherwise, I hope that this was a good just session on basic design principles, set, uh, systems, how we're thinking about our breakpoints. You know the option set for your breakpoints. Um, you know the whole four, everything by four or eight, twenty four, thirty six, etc. Um, for, um, you know, the different systems that you might be using. Um, so hopefully that was really helpful all across the board. Fantastic. Awesome. Uh, if you guys enjoyed the session, Greg has a ton of courses. He's the founder of build camp. He's the OG. Feel free to check it out. He mm -hmm. has flex camp course is just the best design course for bubble. Um, so feel free to check it out there. Um, and for any stuff that I do, I have professional courses and databases and workflows and product. You can go to no code Alliance and check it out there. Um, and, uh, I guess one last question coming in here is, is that a South African accent, Greg? Yeah. Slightly uh, diluted because I've spent most of my life in England, but, um, it is yeah, Cape town. Wow. I didn't know that myself. Fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us all today, guys. We'll send out a recording of this video after the fact to everyone that uh, attended and uh, registered. But otherwise, thanks for joining, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. See ya. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks, JJ.